Okay, the floor is all yours. Yeah, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to speak on green hydrogen and ammonia. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, green hydrogen and ammonia in Minnesota and beyond, and especially in agriculture. So I think it's a, it's a good topic for a board like you to consider. So I want to first start and begin by uh, acknowledging some of our funders, including the state of Minnesota uh, and the United States Department of Energy as well as others, including clean energy resource teams, which I believe that you work with uh, closely as well. Uh, our program goal is to reduce fossil energy consumption, production in agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of drivers for this, uh, both from a consumer standpoint, as well as uh, a lot of the companies, the processors are, are looking to reduce their scope three emissions. And so green nitrogen fertilizer is only one of a portion of the work that we do, but it's a very important portion because it has a uh, impact on not only uh, corn, but also meat and milk and poultry products, as well as biofuels. And there's an estimate about 20 to 25 percent of greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota is attributed to agriculture. About 2 percent of the world's greenhouse gas emissions is attributed to nitrogen fertilizer production. And markets and policies are trending towards the need to reduce greenhouse gas in production and agriculture. So we believe we've had an uh, impact on the national and regional basis. Uh, we've had some nice publications in the Washington Post, Star Tribune, New York Times about the work that we do, including green ammonia. Uh, and, and then the, the Governor Walls in last fall, about a year ago, uh, directed state agencies uh, to pursue federal funding for clean hydrogen market developments in Minnesota. And he signed Executive Order 2222 and called out our work on green ammonia as part of that executive order and following some of our lead in this space. So uh, if you look at climbing the green hydrogen use case ladder in Midwest, uh, there's a lot of applications for green hydrogen and we can use wind and solar to produce green hydrogen as, as well as, as uh, biomass and, and anaerobic digestion. So there's a lot of routes to get to green hydrogen, but uh, from an agricultural standpoint, hydrogen can be used for both ammonia and urea production. And it can also be used for fueling grain dryers and tractors and trucks. And I'll talk more about that. There's opportunities to use both hydrogen and ammonia for power generation and thermal energy. For biofuel production, there's been quite a bit of talk about using green hydrogen to produce sustainable aviation fuel and methanol, as well as you can also produce ethanol without foreign grain. You can use it uh, to produce the hydrogen, capture the CO2, and, and directly produce ethanol. Now, some of these technologies aren't quite ready yet uh, from, a, from a financial standpoint, but they're moving forward quickly. Uh, we can use hydrogen and ammonia to fuel trucks, mining equipment, tractors, train, gen train engines, and ships. And uh, one of the areas that Minnesota uh, is very high ranked in, and perhaps the leader in the country, is the ability to produce green iron and green steel in the state. And in fact, National Renewable Energy Lab uh, did a study, and they, they found that Minnesota was the number one uh, state in the nation for potential for green iron and steel which companies like uh, Volkswagen and Volvo and others are moving towards uh, when they're auto manufacturing. And then in construction, I should mention that steel making is 8% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are responsible for 8%. Construction is actually responsible, responsible for about 6%. And uh, you know, in the process to create quick lime used in concrete, uh, there's a lot of CO2 is used in the in, uh, or produced while combusting or while heating up uh, limestone in kilns. And in addition to that CO2, uh, that process releases CO2 from the limestone. So uh, there's an opportunity perhaps to capture the CO2 there combined with hydrogen to produce things like sustainable aviation fuel or methanol or other mm -hmm. types of fuels. And uh, you know, in, in probably last year or a little over a year ago, talking about these things were kind of down the road. But with the Higher Inflation Reduction Act, uh, these types of systems have have 
garnered a lot more interest now because uh, it's a lot more potential for them to be economic. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So when you look at the hydrogen use case ladder, uh, you know, it, fertilizer ranks up at the top because it's as unavoidable that we're going to be using green hydrogen to produce nitrogen fertilizer. And then you go down the ladder and they, they become a little bit more challenging from an economic standpoint. So uh, many of us in rural areas understand the need for why, why anhydrous ammonia is so important and why nitrogen fertilizer is so important. Uh, anhydrous is the backbone of nitrogen fertilizer. We use it to make the other sources of nitrogen fertilizer, urea, urea ammonium nitrate, uh, even, even monoammonium phosphate and diammonium phosphate, we use ammonia in the production process. And next to water, um, anhydrous or nitrogen fertilizer is the most limiting nutrient. Without the process to make synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, about half the world's population would starve. So that's one reason why it's been identified as one of the top five innovations of, of all time. Uh, because of its importance. And the two principal people that worked out the process, Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch, both won the Nobel Prize for, uh, for this innovation. Uh, we use, primarily we use uh, natural gas to produce anhydrous ammonia. Uh, we do use of coal even in the U.S. to produce ammonia. In, in China, almost all of the ammonia is produced with coal. Uh, so that's a little bit unique in that situation. And again, one to two percent of the world's global greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to nitrogen fertilizer production. Just a sound check, and every can everyone hear me? Sir, yeah. thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Didn't want to get through the presentation and then have someone say you, you didn't have your volume on. <laughs> it's happened before. <laughs> so nit nitrogen fertilizer production worldwide again predominantly uses natural gas or, or coal. These are massive plants. They're called world scale plants. And they're primarily in the US, they're in Gulf Coast. I should say in North America, they're in Gulf Coast in Canada. And they use a process called steam methane reforming and scale definitely matters. You have to get up to a certain scale to make this economical. I think worldwide, there's something like 200 uh, nitrogen fertilizer plants. So very few uh, provide the world supply of, of nit nitrogen. You use about 2.3 tons of water per ton of ammonia produced. Some of that is recovered, but it's still pretty water intensive. Uh, and a current portion of the CO2 that they emit is captured and then used for urea production. So just to give you another, some more information on how it's, what our current system is, the green uh, and the size of the circle, green circles show you the volume of where ammonia is produced and how it's uh, distributed to uh, the Midwest, essentially. So again, most of it's in the Southern Gulf Coast area. Uh, we do import quite a bit from Trinidad and other places uh, in, in uh, Central and in South America. Uh, and you can see, if you look down at the lower graph, you can see Louisiana produces close to 4 million tons. It's number one ranks placed in the, in the country for, our, for ammonia production. And CF has a, their large Donaldsonville plant located there. So ammonia transportation, we do have some pipelines. Uh, a lot of the talk is that they're not util fully utilized, not, I think, moving away from some of the pipelines, in fact. Uh, it's it's barred. We have used barges in the past. Uh, it's a little bit more problematic now with the with uh, the Mississippi and, and uh, the drought situation. And that's one of the problems with urea as well, by the way, is that uh, getting urea up to the Midwest uh, via bar barge is becoming more problem, uh, more of a problem. Uh, we, we use trains uh, to regional storage facilities, trucks to local egg inputters, and then nurse takes to farms. And then we have several large scale regional refrigerated storage faci uh, facilities uh, across the state. And then local egg input fertilizer retailers that handle two to 400 tons. So it is an inhalation hazard. Uh, there's potential for high nit higher nitrates in groundwater. We over fertilize and then ammonia is also a greenhouse gas itself. Uh, from a fueling standpoint though, uh, ammonia can be safer than hydrogen as a fuel and storage, storage medium. And I'll get more into the details of that here soon. So uh, here's some of the typical uh, fertilizers that we use, and these these prices were from 2020. We're starting to get back to those, but it's still still a long process to get down to these levels. 
nearly all forms of nitrogen fertilizer use ammonia as the base. U.S. fertilizer nitrogen fertilizer market is roughly a six billion dollar market. We spend in Minnesota five hundred to a billion dollars per year on nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, if we're able to start uh, green nitrogen fertilizer production within the state, uh, we could see where farmers could have an ownership of of some of their nitrogen fertilizer uh, requirements as well. So that's kind of a nice part about going moving to a green nitrogen fertilizer production system. Here's how. Uh, the process works, you take natural gas, you add nitrogen from air, uh, and you combine those two together in a Haber-Bosch process to form ammonia. You can also produce aqueous ammonia. If you don't go that route, you might uh, add oxygen, produce nitric acid, produce ammonia nitrate. Uh, you could add CO2 to produce urea, to, uh, uh, in urea ammonia nitrate solutions as well, or granular urea. And then also ammonia is used again, as I mentioned, for monoammonia and diammonia phosphates. In fact, Mosaic is, I think, the largest purchaser of ammonia in the U.S., and that's just because of the, their uh, phosphate production in Florida. So, uh, one idea is to use wind and solar to produce nitrogen fertilizer and decarbonize and transform farm energy. We can. Uh, pull nitrogen from the air, we can electrolyze water to form hydrogen, and then we can bind those in a Haber-Bosch reactor, similar to what one's shown to produce anhydrous ammonia. And we can use that for nitrogen fertilizer, tractor fuel, truck fuel, irrigation generators, backup generators, grain drying. Uh, we could also use the hydrogen for advanced fuels, as I mentioned, sustainable aviation fuel, e-methanol, and others as well. So you look Look at the United States, and we have this extremely high wind resource through the central part of the, of the US. And then if you look at the uh, graph on your right, it shows the high producing corn or co high corn producing counties uh, in the Midwest. And if you see the dark green, that's basically referred to as the corn belt. And it makes a nice synergy where you can have that a very high wind resource along with the high demand for anhydrous ammonia. So it's, it's very synergistic to pair wind and ammonia production. So we could meet all the fertilizer demand in the U.S. with about 50,000 megawatts of nameplate wind energy. And we have plenty of capacity to do this. And we could also use excess nuclear power as some utilities have suggested. So uh, why renewable ammonia from a from an economic standpoint. Um, first of all, if you were to produce ammonia using wind and solar, you'd, you'd have more certainty and more stability. You'd decouple from the global natural gas market. Uh, you'd reduce the carbon intensity. So those of you that are involved with, with ethanol, your carbon intensity uh, would dramatically be reduced with a drop in fertilizer. And then right now there's uh, federal clean hydrogen production credits uh, up to $3 a kilogram or $529 per metric ton of ammonia production credit for the first 10 years of production. And you'd likely want to levelize that out over 20, 25 years, the life expectancy of an ammonia plant. I should mention one thing about these uh, tax incentives that are different than in the past. They are uh, not just for indirect income they're not, or passive income. They, uh, they they are made of change that so it's it's uh, more usable for ordinary people. Uh, you can basically subtract out your tax liability and then the IRS will cut you a check or Treasury will cut you a track check for the remaining. So it made it much more uh, broad application, which is also nice. If you look at figure one, here's one of the problems that uh, farmers face is the high volatil volatility of, of the ammonia costs. And uh, one, re you know, people have said, well, it follows natural gas because that's the seed, the feedstock for it. But you can look in 2011, between 2011, 2012, you can see that drop, significant drop in natural gas price, but ammonia stayed high. And you look up and you see the orange uh, bar and you see that corn is high. So um, anhydrous ammonia is, is one of those things that it, it, uh, follows both natural gas and corn prices, and sometimes both, which is the case in 2021 when they both shot up in 2022. So we, you know, it's extremely volatile and it's hard to budget from a farming standpoint. 
So uh, production of green ammonia seems to be an elegant solution. If you can make it work financially and economically, take wind energy, water, and air to produce nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, you start by electrolyzing water, separating the hydrogen and oxygen. You use pressure swing absorption to, to produce the nitrogen. And then you combine the two together in, in a hundred year old technology called Haber-Bosch process to produce ammonia. Step four, you could also take that ammonia and you could capture the CO2 from an ethanol plant or something similar, and you can make urea. And there's a lot of benefits to taking that step, uh, including storage of the product and the safety of the product as well. And so it, it's also uh, somewhat of a circular model where you can uh, produce the corn, uh, produce ethanol from that corn, capture the CO2 from the ethanol production, produce nitrogen fertilizer, bring it back to the corn. And so you're not uh, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions in that process. So we, we uh, established the first wind to ammonia pilot plant in the world back in 2013 at Morris. Um, and uh, we, we operated that plant. It was, it was, as I said, it was the first. So there was some inefficiencies in, in it, but we did uh, validate. It was a proof of concept. It does work. Uh, and uh, there's potential for it. And so subsequently, we received funding to scale up that pilot plant uh, up to 18 times. We're going to be producing one metric ton per day. And we're in the process of, of uh, getting that established. We have several partners in the next generation pilot plant, including uh, University, obviously, but Nell, which is a large electrolyzer manufacturer, Casali, which is a world-renowned ammonia technology engineering company. They have about a 60% market share on, on the large-scale ammonia production facilities. Uh, we have Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina is, is uh, the overall lead. And uh, Excel Energy, GE Research, uh, Great River Energy, Nutrien, AURI, uh, Shell, among others, are, are some of our uh, partners that uh, hope to gain information and experience in this process. And so this is a $18.6 million project. And uh, we'll be, again, hopefully operating the, this new plants within about a year and a half. So we're also doing some other things with the products, the ammonia. We're going to be, GE Research is looking at using ammonia in, in their large gas turbines, uh, doing some modeling on that. We're gonna demonstrate a direct ammonia fuel cell. So you can essentially store hydrogen, store wind energy for a later point in time using ammonia. And we're going to be operating a forklift fueled by ammonia. It's gonna be craft on board to form hydrogen. And then, then we're also uh, you know, obviously using it for fertilizer as well. So demonstrating the full value chain. So uh, I guess it all boils down to, does it work economically? And so this was a study done by Matt Pallas in Prodromus Deatides in Chemical Engineering Material Science, taking a look at three counties in the state to see uh, what the cost would be. And if you look at Stevens County, which is where we're at here in Morris, uh, the result was $572 uh, per metric ton over a 20-year period of time. And Nobles was 542 and Dakota was 620. So the wind resource does matter. Uh, if you can get two cent wind, it's much better, obviously, than four cent wind. And it adds significantly to the cost. But I should mention that these values do not add in the hydrogen production incentive. So once you add in that incentive, it would be roughly $529 per metric ton over a 10 year period of time. And as I said, it you'd likely uh, levelize that for 20 years. So roughly 300 and you know, just over $300 per ton tax credit. So now you can see from a standpoint mm -hmm. that, well, it's, it can be competitive, very competitive with, uh, with what we are currently paying for ammonia anhydrous ammonia in Minnesota. Again, uh, the cost of, of energy makes a big difference. This is a sensitivity analysis to show. Uh, and also the interesting part is we've, we've learned that a hybrid wind solar system is actually ideal because you can produce more of the time, you can produce ammonia more of the time. So wind generally is more prevalent at night and solar obviously during the day. So you combine 
those systems together. And you, uh, so in the bottom on the uh, x-axis is the uh, cost. So $15 for wind, $25 for solar, and it goes up to 35 for wind and $45 per megawatt hour for solar. Uh, and you can see the differences there across. So you can get significant reduction the lower the cost of the energy. So uh, impact of energy price is about $10 per megawatt, uh, or I should say that the other way around, $10 per megawatt reduction in costs uh, equals about $100 per reduction in metric, met per metric ton of ammonia. Again, the Inflation Reduction Act production, hydrogen production tax credit is transformative. Uh, here you can see that it's $356 per metric ton levelized over 20 years. Uh, so uh, the black bar is where the historic ammonia price is. And then the blue bar is what we can, with using technology today without uh, Inflation Reduction Act incentive, uh, you know, we can produce ammonia for about seven, $650 per ton. If you look at 2030, when we expect you know, lower costs with in, increased manufacturing, manufacturing at scale, as well as technology, uh, we'll, we'll be producing it at about $460 per ton. And then if you add in the IRA today, you'd be at about $300 a ton. And then 2030 projection is about $100 a ton. So um, there's certainly potential here. We already have large scale ammonia uh, storage in place. And I guess one point I like to make with this from, a, from an energy storage standpoint, is it's one third of the batteries in place. So if you look up, you have storage at Barnesville, Glenwood, Murdoch, Rosemount and Vernon Center. And if you look in Northern Iowa, there's several across the, the top of the state. So this is, happens to be the CF Industries Glenwood Ammonia Terminal it has capacity for 60,000 tons. You could use the ammonia there to generate 111,000 megawatt hours of electricity. So again, essentially a large scale battery. And when you, when you think about this, fertilizer uh, usages in the spring and the fall, those are shoulder months for the utilities. And so it, the timing is very synergistic that you could use the ammonia storage facilities for, for power production or for thermal energy in the winter and in the middle of the summer and for fertilizer you know, for in the, the shoulder seasons. Most of you are probably familiar with how we handle fertilizer on the farm, but just if you're not, you know, local cooperatives pro provide the ammonia. They have small storage bullet tanks and they fill uh, nurse tanks. Nurse tanks go out in the field and ammonia is applied directly in this case. If you look at the ammonia, or excuse me, the nitrogen fertilizer used by states, uh, anhydrous still uh, is prevalent, particularly in, in the south, because uh, you know it's still cheaper, but it goes on slower, and so you see it more in the southern part of the of the Corn Belt, whereas here in Minnesota and North Dakota, you know, we're, you're starting to see it drive more towards urea, as demonstrated in this slide that. Uh, the blue top blue bar is urea, and the uh, green bar is ammonia. So you see it dropping over time, uh, simply because you know the liability concerns, safety concerns, as well as the amount of time it takes to apply. Again, it's always uh, it's pretty strong market yet, just because it is a cheaper source of nitrogen fertilizer. So I, I've already showed you this uh, slide. Uh, it's the wind resource, uh, in a, and I mentioned the, uh, you know, the the ability to use the very good high wind resource producing areas to lower the cost of ammonia. Um, this black circle that I have drawn in there is actually where our 21 ethanol plants are located in the state, and I'm going to bring this up because of the next portion of the presentation. The opportunity to use uh, wind energy in South Dakota and North Dakota and, and in Minnesota to uh, produce hydrogen and then ammonia and then transfer that ammonia to uh, co ethanol cooperatives or ethanol plants to uh, produce urea. And urea is, a, in my view, is a really good source of nitrogen fertilizer because of, we can store it 
you know, storage costs are, are lower. We can actually control our storage. We don't have to be dependent on some of the large fertilizer companies to use their anhydrous ammonia storage. Uh, it goes on quickly. It's safe, relatively safe, and uh, a lot of benefits along those lines. And just for an example, here's Westcon and Glacial Plains, you know, some of the large uh, urea storage facilities. And the point is here is that it's at a local cooperative basis rather than at, at the uh, you know, multinational company basis when you're storing urea. And you know, if you look at all the cooperatives we have across the U.S., this would be a really good model for cooperatives to uh, participate in the ownership of, of green fertilizer production, green nitrogen fertilizer production, and, and kind of cut out the, everyone else uh, in, in, the, in the process. So uh, there is uh, quite a bit of potential to lower the carbon intensity of agriculture with green ammonia. This is work that was done at, at our facility by Joel Tullickson, Dr. Tullickson. Uh, he, we uh, audited the amount of energy that we used in our, our crop production, as well as livestock production. This, this is focusing on corn here. 36% of the energy was consumed in, in grain drying, or excuse me, in fertilizer production, or nitrogen fertilizer. 42% roughly was used in grain drying. So it, it made us think, well, if we can address those two uh, energy uses, we could significantly reduce the CI of corn production. And then you look at, at uh, field work as well with tractors at 14, all of a sudden we're getting close to a 90% reduction in fossil energy use. And so, you know, the, the, the use of green ammonia for fertilizer was well known and that's pretty easy transition is to drop in for that. But the use of ammonia for uh, fuel is, is a little bit lesser known, quite a bit lesser known. But when you look at the molecule, it's very similar to our hydrocarbons in that you just replace this, the carbon with nitrogen. And uh, the other part that's, you know, some say, well, why don't we just produce hydrogen with wind and solar and then uh, store it and transport it around where we need it? Well, ammonia is 10 times to 100 times less costly to store and transport than hydrogen. It's actually 100 times less costly for above ground and 10 times less costly than below ground for geological storage of hydrogen. So uh, ammonia has uh, gained a lot of attention worldwide for use as an energy carrier. And so we're going to get into a little bit more about that. My nice colleagues, again, Matt Pallas and Fredroma Steatides did a study looking at using uh, ammonia for, for an energy carrier, energy storage, uh, in a system where they had, uh, these were 16 cities, uh, and they could select, the model could select which to use, whether it was wind or solar, based on their production profiles. And then they could select a battery, uh, could select using hydrogen to generate electricity, or uh, ammonia. And if you look over at the graph, the red triangles are the combination of hydrogen and ammonia. The blue, uh, the blue squares is hydrogen, or excuse me, is ammonia, and the blue is hydrogen. Oh, I got that. Sorry, I'm not looking at the key. The blue is hydrogen, the green is ammonia. So in most all cases, uh, a combination of hydrogen and ammonia was the best storage uh, medium. And this, this paper, by the way, won the award for the best uh, publication in computational chemical engineering back in 2020. If you look at batteries, they, they didn't even come close in many cases here to compete with hydrogen and ammonia for energy storage. Uh, and the, the reason for this is the long, it's cost the much for long-term storage. So hydrogen is better for short-term storage because you do have some costs, efficiency loss by producing ammonia, but if you're gonna produce or store hydrogen for more than a day, it's better to convert it to ammonia and store it in that manner. So uh, my colleagues in mechanical engineering, uh, Will Northrup, Professor Will Northrup, he has done quite a bit of work looking at uh, using ammonia for combustion uh, for uh, both, for a number of different reasons we'll get into. Uh, one of the challenges is it's, it is difficult to combust, but you can do it. They, they have a swirl uh, type nozzle that they use. 
And you can, if you look in the middle picture or the, the right picture, you can see the flame swirling. And, the, and by the way, uh, ammonia does not burn blue, it burns orange. And it's not that it's it's uh, not complete combustion, it is. It's just that the, the there's no carbon in it. So that's the reason why you get the blue flame. Um, the, these, there's still some issues. We're still picking up some high, higher levels of N2O and NOx emissions that are working on that, but I think we have routes to, to uh, correct those issues. So we successfully demonstrated a, a grain dryer back in November of 2022 uh, using ammonia and worked fine. Uh, we did mix in a little bit of hydrogen in that process. The next systems will use 100% ammonia. Back in 2019, we did a tractor using ammonia as well. Uh, so uh, we've demonstrated that it worked fine as well. And there's other companies now that uh, are looking at fuel cell tractors and semis. And this is uh, Amagi, which is a company based out of Brooklyn, New York, that has been gaining a lot of attention. So I just want to mention that. Uh, we do have other projects looking at ammonia's fuel, both in a portable engine gen set as well as in a combined cycle uh, ga uh, gas turbine plant uh, with Excel Energy, NGRE in fact. So there are some barriers for moving forward in this. Electrolyzer supply is challenging. Uh, the, the quantity of electrolyzers is needed is massive. Scale is challenging because it does it still matters even though. We expect these will be smaller scale than the world scale plants. Financing, you know, these are capital intensive projects. Um, developing the right partners, you need utilities involved, potentially. You need ethanol plants, potentially. So just getting that right mix cooperatives to have the offtake. Uh, storage uh, is challenging, especially on anhydrous ammonia, urea, it's a little bit easier. Uh, we don't have experience in this field. It's like it's a little bit like when the ethanol industry first started, that it's uh, we just don't have the people in place, the, the companies in place that do this kind of work here in Minnesota. Pricing is is challenging. Usually you think of, of ammonia from natural gas as being extremely volatile, but it, it does hit $200 a ton sometimes. If you go, if you're using wind energy to produce ammonia, you could have a price locked in for 20 years, but at some point natural gas might be lower. So then how do you mitigate that risk? And then there's very sophisticated competition here. These nitrogen fertilizer companies are massive companies. They've been around for a long time. Um, there's also other entities moving into this space. There's utilities, there's oil and gas companies uh, that are very large and very sophisticated. So it's a matter of how do we how do we compete against those as farmers and cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And the last bullet here is that you know ownership of fertilizer demand should trump all other competition. Farmers own the demand for fertilizer. If farmers want to buy it from themselves or from their co-op, they can do that. Uh, look at my clock here. I uh, have a few more minutes, but so I I really believe that green nitrogen fertilizer is a gateway to using hydrogen for other applications. In Minnesota, I mentioned green steel already, but uh, from an agricultural standpoint, the ability to produce sustainable aviation fuel or methanol using using biofuels and in the combination of biofuels and hydrogen produced from wind and solar is very attractive. And companies like Delta and Maersk, you know, large transportation companies and shipping companies are, are moving in this direction. So you can pull together this whole picture that Minnesota uh, could be a leader in all of these areas and they'll all benefit from each other. So when you develop the green fertilizer, green nitrogen fertilizer industry, that will su help support the green steel industry. And, and the green steel industry will help support the sustainable aviation fuel industry because that'll mean there will be localizer supplies that will be adequate. There'll be uh, you know, companies that are supporting these services, et cetera. So the take home message is that the Inflation Reduction Act provides $3 a kilogram of hydrogen production incentive. And this will dramatically change the playing field. You know, this this will happen in in the Midwest. It's just a matter of who it will happen with when it comes to green ammonia. This production incentive is is so valuable that uh, companies will do this. Uh, I guess where 
I've been trying to suggest that the co-ops and others farm groups should be the ones that are working in this area to try to take a piece of that pie. We're working to improve the technology. However, again, I think the uh, systems that are available now are commercially ready and ready for deployment in the Midwest. So question is, how do we best position ourselves to take advantage of this opportunity? Again, I think cooperatives, ethanol plants, uh, entities like this need to be working together, uh, utilities to make sure that we can keep some of this, these, this value in Minnesota. Uh, our focus is on agriculture and bringing this technology to, mid to the farmers, but there are you know, much broader implications for the region. Uh, Farmer-owned cooperatives could utilize renewable hydrogen production for anhydrous ammonia, urea, methanol, sustainable aviation fuel, and other molecules. You know, I didn't, didn't get into that, but uh, you know, the old saying is that 90% of the revenue from refineries comes for 10% of the products. Well, if you're producing green urea, uh, that means products like DEF and cosmetics that use quite a bit of urea and ammonia in them. You know, you can have green products that no one else has, has to offer to these companies. So I think green nitrogen fertilizer is transformative and is a gateway for other green hydrogen energy applications within the Midwest. I think uh, just to give credit to our staff, we have, I think we have driven faculty and staff and uh, my tag is leading innovation in agriculture and beyond. I think uh, we do that in many different areas at the West Central Research and Learning Center. So with that, I'd be happy to address any questions you might have. I'll stop sharing if somebody wants to go back to a slide, I can do that as well. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's take questions from in the conference room first, and then we'll certainly take questions for anyone online uh, to do that if anyone has questions. So, um, anybody on site have questions, follow up questions? Dan, right. yeah, Michael, this is Dan Wilderman. <clears throat> you mentioned about the high volume of water that you need for this process. That doesn't necessarily have to be the purest, more fresh water, does it? Well, it depends on depends on what you're using it for. I guess the point I made with the with the conventional ammonia process, it, it already does use large amounts of water. In fact, they're about equal. So, water is a concern. You you'd just as, as it is with ethanol, although it's not at that volume. Uh, it's, it's far less than what an ethanol plant would consume. Um, but uh, you could use poor quality water, but it still would have to be you know, go through a filtering process. Uh, to produce the hydrogen and nitrogen, or excuse me, the hydrogen, I should say. Part of my thought process for, for fresh water, uh, our local uh, rural water had a reverse osmosis system that they had used quite successfully, but they had to shut it down because the effluent coming out was so high in nitrates. Yeah. What would that water do if you were able to take that basic wastewater from from a reverse osmosis process? Could you use that in this process? But the answer is yes. I guess the the, the question there is, you know, can you use it economically? So that uh, they would still most likely need to be filtered in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so, because. The real answer is I don't know. It sounds like it's a good opportunity. I don't want to give you a, a false impression, though, that it that it definitely will, will work. But the nitrates themselves couldn't be consumed in the process. You'd have to filter them out before you used in the process. So you still have that waste product of high nitrate. Uh, again, I, I'm just trying to think through that. I I think. Uh, I think I'd rather follow up with you. I think it's a very good question. It's a good opportunity. Just, you know, when you start when you start getting down into the depth like that and fine details, uh, you, know, you can run into something that causes a problem that would, that it costs, you know, more than what it's worth. So let me follow up with you and the board on that. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions, Gene? Uh, Mike, Gene, Masters from Nobles County. How does your uh, model work if, Someday our federal subsidies go on on both uh, American recovery funds and possibly uh, subsidy on wind production. And when when could that happen? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't have I don't have a crystal ball to answer that necessarily, but I I will say that 
as time goes on, they, they, they will achieve parity. In fact, you know, the, it depends on so many factors, you know, what if our pipelines for natural gas going to be, you know, permits going to be renewed and all those things. So, you know, there will be a time when, when natural gas and renewable sources will, without incentives, without tax benefits, will be equal. And it's just a matter of, you know, there, we're, we're building our wind infrastructure, we're building our solar infrastructure. Uh, natural gas has a lot of different applications worldwide. So, you know, there's going to be continuing demand for that as well. So it's a, it's a good question. It's just a tough question to answer. Um, and I, I'm not, I don't know how, what the politics, you know, what the political scene is going to come out at, you know, at the next legislative or next election cycle. I don't think any of us really know at this point in time. But I do, I do know though that these, once tax credits are passed, it's very difficult to roll them back. And so these IRA tax credits are available for 10 years. Uh, so 2032. And anytime that you start the process or you start producing hydrogen in that time frame, it adds that you get a 10 year tax credit. So it'll it'll essentially you could start producing in 2032 and you could get tax credits till 2042. One one more question. How long does it take to permit a site like this or who gets involved in that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think typically for fertilizer, uh, it'll take about a three year pro it'll be about three year process, two to three years. And that that's uh, per that includes everything. So permitting, uh, you know, the uh, sourcing the equipment, procurement, engineering, all those things. So I think the the shortest time frame would be in that two to three year window. Uh, permitting, though, you know, when you think about wind, the, one of the biggest holdups is the MISO application or interconnection process. You know, there, there's opportunities here where you don't need to go through the interconnect interconnection process. Uh, you can you know, just have a, a merchant plant that sells the power directly to uh, this fertilizer company. So that, that hurdle could be removed. And that's why I want some, a lot of the wind developers like this. There's, there's, there's several projects that have been announced. There's an 800 megawatt uh, project at Spearwood, North Dakota that Nextera and CF Industries are pursuing. And there's similar projects around the, the state and around the Midwest. Okay, thanks, Mike. Yep. Additional questions from the room? What other agencies are going to permit these? You mentioned permitting, so obviously we're thinking of the, the wind tower. Mm -hmm. That, but there's the MPCA, other state agencies. Would what? Which ones would be involved in any type of permitting process? Well, the MPCA uh, would be involved, and as well as uh, you know, Minnesota Department of Agriculture on the ammonia side. Yeah, the MDA has uh, regulatory authority over uh, most ammonia uh, facilities in that are agricultural related. Uh, so those those would be the two that come to mind, and then EPA would have a role in it as well because you'd need a risk management plan for the quantities of ammonia that you'd be storing at these sites. Good. Questions from folks that are online. We have 20, 30 folks online. If there's some questions here, you can either raise your hand or just go ahead. Or you can drop them in the chat as well. Anybody online? Raise your hand or drop it in the chat. Additional questions from folks here? Mike, uh, I'm wondering, so if you're around here, and I know there's at least one person that's involved with economic development here. So if you're with an EDA or you're in that business community or you have a um, 
a park in your area, the industrial park, uh, you're really thinking this is a great opportunity. What are those next steps? Are you talking to co-ops? Are you trying to promote that, hey, we've got these sites and we've got this great wind energy resource and we've got big solar, uh, tons of it's in the Southwest region here. Um, what would you say are your recommendations for, what are the next steps for an area that's, who wants to be attractive for those types of industries to, to build here? Yeah, I, I yes. Talk to co-ops, talk to Minnesota Department of Ag would be a good place to uh, visit. Uh, you know, and if you, and feel free to contact me. We we have some partners that work in this space, so it'd be good uh, good entities to to help move projects forward. You know, and, and then I think look for opportunities at a state and federal level. State has a a grant program that was funded for co-ops to participate in green nitrogen fertilizer projects so they could invest in them to kind of get some seed dollars going. Uh, that that uh, grant program is going to be coming out, possibly some people on the call here that would be better to answer, but I'm guessing in the spring sometime. And then the federal government, they had a large call about a year ago uh, it was for up to a uh, hundred million dollars for uh, domestic fertilizer production, and so you know there, there's some federal opportunities as well. So U.S. U.S. Department of uh, USDA, you know the rural development people would probably be good people to start with. These are I, I don't want to get give the illusion that these are are uh, small efforts. I mean these are large efforts. These are uh, at least hundred million dollar plus, you know, billion up to a billion dollar efforts. But the key part here is that the economics work, and so if there's ways that we can work out the financing, work out, you know, funding these projects. Uh, there's obviously value in keeping the ownership within the state. Okay, there's uh, something in the chat here too. Uh, I noticed that. Where the most wind is are in water pool areas. You envision that each windmill will be using groundwater to make hydrogen. Where there's more water, there's less wind. Will groundwater be mined? Yeah, I think I think that's definitely a possibility. Again, it's it's part of the siting, you know, siting issues that need to be dealt with. Um, you know, Minnesota is in general has has good water resources, whereas other places are talking about this probably doesn't. Doesn't have the the water that we have, and again, it's it's already being consumed for the process. It's just in a different different part of the country. Um, but when you look at it on a per acre basis, which is I like to do it, it's about forty gallons an acre. And you think of what an irrigator puts on per acre, you know, thousands of gallons per acre. You know, it's really a small amount of of water in the big picture of things that when it when it comes to agriculture. Obviously, for that production site, it is it will be uh, it'll be significant, and need to go through the permitting process and make sure that uh, we're not uh, d depriving or, or using too much of our groundwater. And and again, I'd like I did like the idea that we do have a considerable amount of wastewater that uh, is probably an area that we need to do more research in uh, using that wastewater for you know, electrolyze the wastewater do technologies like that to help uh, mitigate this issue. Any other questions online? Or from the room? There, there was a comment there that water that's pumped locally will not return to the same area, that, that's valid. You know, we, we, use, we use water in a lot of our industrial processes. And so I, I know it's a, uh, it's a difficult thing. It's it's like nitrogen fertilizer in general. I mean, we're we're balancing two issues. We're balancing trying to feed the world and make sure that we have enough food with over fertilization. We don't want to do that either. So there's a balance there. There's a balance in, in how we use our water and how much we use, and we want to be careful of sensitive areas. There are no more questions. Uh, Michael, appreciate your time and presentation. I think it gives us a lot to think about uh, in terms of how all that can come, up, come together. Certainly a lot of moving parts.
times of scale and financing and co-ops and energy and a lot of folks got to come together to make it but uh, we definitely need to keep looking at alternatives for energy usage also yeah. well thank you appreciate it appreciate the opportunity have a good day